Thank you, Pastor. We are studying tonight the maze of Mormonism, and in order to do that, we're going to need our Bible. So if you don't have one with you, just reach into the pew in front of you and turn in your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 13. Deuteronomy chapter 13. I'd like to read a few verses from the Old Testament and then a few from the New Testament. <coughs> if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a miracle, and the sign or the miracle comes to pass whereof he spake unto thee. And he says, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. The Lord your God put you to the test to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God. You shall fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and cling to him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be executed because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God. I want you to notice in verse 5 what the purpose of a false prophet is. The false prophet may not even be aware of it himself, but the purpose is very clear. He had spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you from the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of slavery. He has spoken to thrust you out of the way which the Lord your God commands you to walk in. So you shall put this evil away from the midst of you. It was a capital offense under the old covenant to be a false prophet. The false prophet was someone that spoke in the name of God and then supernaturally influenced the people so that they were led astray from the worship of the true God. The false prophet was energized by satanic power, not by divine power. So in the Old Testament, you have multiple references to false prophets and false teachers. Here is one of the clearest on record. Now, it establishes the fact that there are false prophets. In 2 Peter, it states, as there were false prophets among the people, the Jews, there will be false teachers among you who secretly shall bring in destructive doctrines, even, teach, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So Deuteronomy 13 stands out because it tells you what a false prophet is, it tells you what their purpose is and what they intend to do. And the intent is to lead away from the Lord our God, to thrust us out of the path that God has told us to walk in. Now today, we do not execute false prophets. But in the Old Covenant, under Mosaic theocracy, they did execute them, which tells you that God considered it a capital offense, equal to murder, because you can murder a person's soul or spirit just as you can murder a person's body. And the Scripture here is giving you that principle very clearly. Secondly, in the epistle to the Galatians in the New Testament, if you will turn to that, the Scripture is most explicit once more in dealing with this very same problem. Paul had established the church at Galatia, and he was concerned that these young Gentile believers should be led astray from the truth of the gospel. And so he specifically lines out the dangers. Verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you to the grace of Christ to another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you, and they would pervert, the Greek word is to change or alter, they would change or alter the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel out of heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. I want to read that verse again. Though we, that's the apostles themselves, though we, or an angel out of heaven preaches any other gospel to you than the one which we have preached to you, 
Count him damned. Anathema means damned under divine damnation. We said before, I say it now again. Notice the repetition. If anyone preaches any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be anathema under the divine curse. Now, in 1823, in Palmyra, New York, an angel named Moroni allegedly appeared to a young man named Joseph Smith, Jr., told him to go dig in the hill Camorra in upper New York State, and there Joseph, after digging, allegedly found miraculous plates of gold, and on them, written in a strange language, reformed Egyptian hieroglyphics, was what is today known as the Book of Mormon, originally known as the Golden Bible. Joseph couldn't read the characters, and so the angel obligingly provided him with the Urim and the Thummim from the Old Testament, which allegedly looked like large spectacles. And when Joseph put them on and looked at the plates, then the reformed Egyptian turned into King James English and it was recorded as the Book of Mormon. Now that's how Mormonism began. But it also had an earlier beginning when Joseph was only 15 years of age, where allegedly he received a revelation from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, both of whom appeared to him. I might add in direct violation of God's own word, for God the Father has said no one can look upon him and live and yet he appeared with Jesus Christ to Joseph Smith and then gave a message. That message wiped out the entire Christian church. Mormonism, the religion, does not believe in the validity of any Christian communion. It does not believe that it is Protestant or Catholic. Mormonism teaches that it is the restoration of the true gospel which was lost after the first century of the Christian era. So when God the Father and Jesus Christ allegedly appeared to Joseph, a message was given to Joseph. All the sects of Christendom were wrong. That wiped out all of the churches. All the creeds of Christendom were an abomination to God. That wiped out the creeds. And all of the professors in Christendom were corrupt, so that wiped out all the people. What was left? Joseph Smith and Mormonism. And that's exactly what the Mormon church teaches. They do not make any bones about stating, and this comes from Mormon Doctrine, edition 1966, by a Mormon apostle, that the Mormon church alone is the source of salvation. Through its priesthood, there is no salvation apart from the Mormon church. Now, Mormons will say, we don't believe that. No, then why do you publish it? Don't publish what you don't believe. Publish what you do believe. And they have published this because salvation to Mormons is resurrection of the body. It's entirely different vocabulary. Now, Joseph was persecuted for practicing polygamy. He instituted polygamy around 1838. We know that he had a number of wives himself, and that Brigham Young, who succeeded him, had 27 wives and 56 children. Now, why did...